Our next um, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Jay Ebert, is uh, a lecturer at the Human um, Sciences School within the University of Western Australia. He's also a director and full-time practicing therapist um, at uh, Hollywood Functional Rehabilitational Clinical, HFRC, as it's known now. He's also a director of research at uh, Perth Orthopaedic Sports Medicine Research Institute, uh, which is attached to a a rather large orthopaedic group here in, in Western Australia. He's also director of the Orthopaedic Research Foundation of Western Australia. Um, and his clinical and research work in particular has been focused around cartilage repair for the last 20 years. And it's been a pleasure uh, to have worked with, with Jay over, over every one of those 20 years. Um, as a result of his work, he's been made a fellow um, of exercise and sports science. Australia, and also, which is pretty rare for an exercise physiologist, he's been a, made an honorary fellow of the Australian Orthopaedic Association. Uh, he has published extensively, presented extensively, um, very uh, high quality international peer reviews, uh, and has undertaken collaborations with orthopaedic surgeons in conducting randomised studies and prospective studies. Um, uh, extremely well known across the globe for his work, and so uh, without further ado, uh, I'll hand over to Jay. Thank you, Jay. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, and certainly, uh, thanks very much for the invite to, uh, to be here as part of the webinar. Um, I'm gonna move a little bit away from the ankle and, and my focus here will be a little bit more on the knee, uh, but certainly my goal here is to speak about some of our clinical outcomes, looking at ACI uh, in patients um, with knee chondral defects and some of the later stage outcomes, uh, but also talk a little bit more about the rehab side of things as well. So just to kick off, uh, I will speak a little bit about some of our ACI experience uh, very briefly, but again, there will be a bit more of a focus on that longer term patient data. And here we're really talking about that 10 to 15 year time point. And uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about rehab, more so a, a general synopsis of rehab in the time that I have. And there are a few resources getting around that can certainly be made available if people do want to know a, a little bit more. So first up, I think we all can appreciate that cartilage is a, a remarkable tissue. It has fairly unique uh, biomechanical qualities, but it can have a, a fairly poor capacity to repair. So as we've seen uh, with these chondral defects, uh, symptomatic defects, if they're not treated well, then they can progress. And these are the patients that, that may move a little bit quicker down that pathway toward a, a knee replacement. Uh, we've also seen a benefit of ACI thus far, um, certainly in terms of clinical outcomes, uh, but also in terms of the regeneration of a, a high and the light tissue repair. And that's already been highlighted by both Prof Zeng and, and Prof Sullivan. Now, there are a range of factors that will contribute to a, a more optimal outcome. And of course, cell culturing and the surgical technique fits quite strongly into that. Uh, a cooperative patient, and we do certainly see that this is one of those techniques, like many, where patients need to be really well educated, fully informed, uh, they need to be able to follow instruction, otherwise they may very well jeopardise uh, the integrity of that procedure before it really takes hold. And of course, a timely progression of load bearing and rehab, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, but certainly the rehab side of it becomes important, not only from that early protection and even progressive stimulation of cell perspective, but also in that later stage retraining, uh, strength, functional capacity, and really moving people back to what they want to do. What we want here are satisfied patients and uh, the surgical technique on its own, unfortunately, does not always do that. Now, this has already been mentioned as well, and obviously we've seen a real evolution of the technique over time. So periosteal covered ACI was mentioned by Professor Sullivan. Uh, and of course, that was where there was that uh, harvest of periosteum to effectively provide a cover uh, for that cell-based solution. Uh, we certainly in, in Perth, Western Australia, um, saw that for the first uh, early couple of years, but from about 99, 2000, uh, there was a bit of a move toward collagen covered ACI, uh, which really is better defined as that second generation 
of the autologous chondrocyte implantation technique. Now, obviously that took away the requirement of the periosteum, uh, but it still required uh, suturing of that cover. So from a rehab perspective, still quite invasive, uh, certainly created a lot of that early musculoskeletal deficit, but we really needed to be a little bit more wary given that that cover sat at or even above the, the height of the adjacent native cartilage. Uh, from about 2001, uh, we did see uh, matrix induced uh, or associated or assisted ACI. And uh, as Prof Zeng had mentioned, this is really where the cells are now embedded in that 3D construct. And it's effectively glued to the base of the subchondral bone. So it almost ends up being a little bit more protected, which is great from an early rehab pathway, uh, but it also means it's a much uh, less invasive technique. So just briefly, a little bit of our experience, certainly uh, 2001 uh, was where I sort of came on board and certainly the last 20 years have, have uh, in a way steamrolled from there. So the very early days, we had some prospective studies uh, really presenting outcomes over time in patients embarking on ACI in the knee, uh, but also ACI concomitantly with a whole range of other techniques, uh, such as the use of a, an offloading osteotomy, uh, even in those early stage arthritic cases. So we really appreciate now they're probably not the best candidates for the technique, uh, but some of the early work, we were a little bit more lax with our, with our inclusion criteria. Uh, we've looked at the role of ACI in the telefemoral joint. These were some earlier studies. We've actually had a couple of later stage uh, patellofemoral joint bias studies that have been published. And certainly the outcomes in the pat patellofemoral joint early on were probably not as good as the tibiofemoral joint. Uh, certainly the outcomes that we have seen in the patellofemoral joint have been just as good, if not better, than that in the tibiofemoral joint. Certainly when uh, any underlying malalignment is addressed. Uh, we've actually seen uh, some arthroscopic techniques, certainly in Western Australia. Uh, so this is something that we followed quite closely. Um, it is not uh, a technique that at the moment at least is uh, permittable for all graft locations, but certainly the femoral condyles and the tibial plateau, we've seen really good outcomes uh, for quite sizable grafts. Uh, and again, the underlying premise behind an arthroscopic technique is that reduction in pain and swelling and muscular deficit. It really allows a lot of patients uh, to hit the ground running, although we still have to be wary about that maturation timeline. Uh, rehab. So I'll come back to this a little bit later, but this has been a big part of some of my research, looking at developing and almost trying to optimise rehab pathways. Uh, certainly more recently, we've seen some, some longer term studies uh, looking at the progression of, of weight bearing after ACI, particularly in that weight bearing tibiofemoral joint. And certainly from a clinical perspective now, uh, we generally see a full weight bearing attained around that five to six week mark, uh, depending on any concomitant surgery. And we have been able to successfully uh, accelerate some of those rehab pathways over time as well. Uh, there are some, uh, some commentaries and some reviews that we've written. And again, these can certainly be made available for anyone that wants uh, somewhat of a more comprehensive overview without having to trawl through all the various research papers that got it to that point. And there's been a bunch of other studies that we've embarked on over time, certainly given the numbers that we've seen. So some of that might be uh, looking at the restoration of uh, knee kinetics and kinematics, so biomechanical outcomes, uh, looking at the restoration of strength and how that starts to correlate with patient clinical scores and uh, even patient satisfaction. Uh, we've looked at different studies, um, certainly looking at factors that may be more predictive of patient outcome. Uh, we've looked at uh, the evaluation of various outcome measures, specifically for people embarking on ACI in the knee. Uh, and we've even looked at things like graft hypertrophy and its association with outcome, and even the association between 
uh, subchondral bone changes, uh, as was outlined a little earlier by Prof Zing, and how that may well influence outcomes, uh, graft outcomes after ACI. So quite a mix in, uh, in that rehab, uh, in that research uh, around ACI, certainly in the knee joint. Uh, but this is what I want to move on to now. So really as part of, of this uh, talk moving forward, I want to speak a little bit more about some outcomes that were published in the earlier part of this year, as well as some other outcomes that have more recently been accepted for publication also in AJSM, uh, but not yet available online. So these are some, some later stage clinical and MRI based outcomes. Now, what I will say is this particular study was actually a little bit more focused around uh, an RCT comparing two different rehab pathways. Uh, but really, I'll look to group this cohort together um, with respect to some of those late stage outcomes. So for this study, uh, we actually started recruiting in late 2003. Now, for this study, we recruited 70 patients. Um, but really what I'm going to talk about here are some of those late stage outcomes. So of the 70 that we had recruited, uh, we were able to uh, clinically review 60 or about 86% at that minimum 10 year follow up. Now I should point out, yes, there were 10 patients that we were not able to evaluate. Of those five, we just could not locate. And that is to be expected to some degree so far down the chain, certainly with a, a fairly young cohort uh, that's uh, quite transient. Um, we had uh, one who had deceased. We had one who more recently embarked on a knee reconstruction after a sporting incident and couldn't be clinically reviewed. And we did have three patients that had already gone down the path of a knee replacement. So they weren't clinically reviewed, but it's important to note there were three of those cases, and I'll come back to those a little bit later as well. It's also important to note that all of these patients embarked on a structured rehab program. And again, there were two rehab pathways, but it was closely followed. Now we know the rehab side, certainly that uh, progressive mechanical stimulus is really important for uh, cell stimulus and proliferation and tissue development. It's also important in restoring all those deficits. So again, this was a cohort of patients that didn't just undergo matrix-induced ACI. They underwent surgery with a few different concomitant surgeries, but in association with a good, structured, uh, well-supervised rehab program. From an assessment perspective, we looked at a whole range of patient reported outcome measures of which some uh, are outlined there. Uh, functionally, we looked at things like the progression of knee range of motion, some fairly basic functional measures like a six minute walk test. Uh, we looked at functional hop capacity. And of course, hop testing is something that's used and reported uh, quite routinely, uh, certainly in that younger, more active cohort. And we also uh, look at things like uh, peak isokinetic quadricep and hamstring strength. Now, when we look at some of these measures like hops and strength, uh, we often report uh, peak values, but we also report limb symmetry indices, which is really a, a representation of the operated side as a percentage of their non-operated side. So I'll just throw that out there now because I will refer to some of the LSIs uh, very soon. We all looked at high resolution MRI. Now with respect to MRI, most of our, our graft associated scoring has been based around the MOCART scoring tool. So the way that this works is it allows us to look at uh, different parameters of graft repair, uh, things like signal intensity, which might be a little more reflective of tissue maturation, uh, the amount of graft infill and other variables like the way the graft has integrated uh, not only with the adjacent native cartilage, but also that underlying bone. Um, the other beauty of this type of scoring tool is we can then take those variables and we can weight them and we can look at an overall MRI composite score. 
And again, I'll refer to that a little bit more, but it's really a, a more holistic measure of the integrity of that graph. So I'll talk through some of the outcomes. Um, certainly with respect to the surveys or the PROMs, we saw a significant improvement um, really in all PROMs over about one to two years, maintenance to five years, and then some fairly encouraging maintenance now out to that minimum 10 year timeframe. So this just demonstrates the KUS subscale of pain. Um, in this particular cohort, you can see that progressive improvement up until about two years, a well-maintained mean score at five, uh, and certainly out to 10 years. Uh, just picking off uh, one other one, the KUS subscale of symptoms. Again, that increase to two years, uh, maybe a very mild, though certainly non-significant decline to five, uh, but maintained to 10 years. And really all of the PROMs, even though they all measure something a little bit differently, uh, generally follow the exact same trend. With some of the objective scores, we saw a significant improvement over time in that six minute walk test, but also active uh, knee flexion and extension range of motion. But we also saw this significant improvement in strength and functional capacity, which we would hope to see. Now, what I've got in the table down the bottom are really the mean, at least the bolded values, the mean LSIs of a couple of the more common hop tests that are used, as well as a peak knee extension or quadricep torque and peak knee flexion or hamstring torque. And even looking at those means, most of those LSIs, the mean LSIs are above 95%. And again, these are those late stage, minimum 10 year outcomes. Uh, even when you look across the cohort, the percentage of patients presenting with an LSI above 90%, which seems to be a fairly common and well-reported criterion for recovery, uh, are generally around that 80 to 90% mark. So again, we're really happy that even at minimum 10 years, patients are feeling good, uh, they're fairly satisfied, uh, but objectively, they also measure really well. So their physical capacity is, is quite good. Some of the MRI scores, so uh, a bit of a mix here, but overall a significant improvement to two years. Now it's important to note that, that these figures obviously aren't quite to scale, uh, but there was an improvement to a year, um, a very mild but non-significant decline to two years. And that's really on the back of one or two failures that occurred between one and two years that of course are retained in the MRI based scores that we have. If you look at graft infill on that top figure, again, you can see that non-significant decline to five, but actually maintenance from five years out to 10 years. A similar trend for that overall MRI composite score. And again, I will reiterate, uh, the figure is not to scale, and uh, the, the mild but non-significant decline that appears on the figures is really because of the failures that did occur, which I'll discuss next. So MRI overall at 10 years, uh, of the 56 MRIs, 46 patients, 82% had a good to excellent MRI score which again, for a minimum 10 year follow-up is actually really encouraging. Important to note, there were four graph failures that were picked up on MRI, irrespective of whether those patients were actually symptomatic or not. And it's also important to note that outside of that cohort, there were those three patients that had embarked on a knee replacement between their five and their minimum 10 year follow-up. Also really important to note here that those three patients at the time of surgery were 59, 62 and 63 years old. They were actually the three oldest patients in the cohort. And we now know that it is the sort of patient realistically that is probably not a prime candidate for ACI in the first place. So um, we need to think a little bit more about patient selection and that's certainly what we do now. 
Uh, this was just one patient taken from the cohort. So I haven't got the time frames here, but we've got an A, B, C, D, and E, which is really representative of that MRI at three months, 12 months, 24 months, five months, and minimum at 10 years. So between the arrows, you can see getting up to two years, which is that C diagram, uh, good infill, uh, good integration of that graft, fairly well sustained at five years, which is D. But as you move on to E, uh, this is still a very well integrated graft. And this is an absolute asymptomatic patient, but you can still see some changes um, in that joint compared to uh, the earlier timeframes. Uh, this is one other patient. So at five years, you can see a fairly well integrated and satisfied, integrated graft and satisfied patient. But at 10 years, this was a graft that had effectively failed. So this was uh, now a delaminated graft picked up on MRI, uh, despite having a fairly favourable outcome at five years post-surgery. Satisfaction. So this was just in those 60 patients reviewed at 10 years. Satisfaction uh, for relieving pain um, above 90% of patients, improving ADLs above 90% of patients, and even improving the ability to return to recreational activities, such as that listed, above 90%. It was quite encouraging that even the patient's perceived ability to return to sport, more than 80% were happy with what they had got back to. Just really briefly, and I was hoping to have a, a paper that was at least available online, but not quite yet. So this is another cohort. Um, this was a cohort that has been followed prospectively over time. Again, this is Macy uh, with getting up to 15 to 16 year follow-up. Uh, it included 99 graphs, uh, a bit of a mix, but certainly more biased towards your tibiofemoral lesions. And again, what we saw here was a significant improvement in all proms over that time frame. We had nine graft failures out of the 99. It was also interesting to note that with this group, um, outside of the, the benefits that I spoke about with that other cohort, between five years and that final follow-up, we still saw a significantly um, uh, improvement in not only the KUS subscale of sport, but also in that quadricep strength LSI. And I have no doubt that even though patients are really happy and traveling well at two and five years, um, as they move further forward from there, they gradually become more active, they're more satisfied and don't think about their knee, and their physical capacity probably improves further. So just to wrap up from um, some of those outcomes, quite clearly ACI, ACI has produced some really encouraging clinical outcomes and a functional hyaline-like, fairly robust repair tissue to five years that's maintained in the majority of patients beyond 10 years. Really good level of satisfaction. And just moving on to the next part of this talk, uh, what about the rehab? So the outcomes we've seen are, are good, um, very encouraging now beyond 10 years. Uh, but certainly the rehab provides, uh, in my mind, a pivotal part of those outcomes. So I'm gonna move on. As I'd mentioned uh, earlier, we've seen the evolution of the technique and it's really important to note that this evolution of the technique has also given us a little bit more drive to accelerate that rehab pathway. As I'd also mentioned earlier, we've seen um, a technique that has moved from a very open invasive arthrotomy to something quite small, to something that may well be arthroscopic. Now, whilst we need to think long and hard about that tissue maturation, we know that somebody who has an arthroscopic technique, their graft is not gonna mature and grow any faster than somebody who, who has had it through a mini arthrotomy. We do know that a less invasive approach uh, permits less pain, 
Uh, there's less edema, there's less soft tissue irritation, and there's less early muscular deficit. So if we can stem that early flow, uh, then we can restrict their muscle atrophy and we can get them moving a, a little bit quicker. So a few considerations for rehab. Firstly, as I've already mentioned, that maturation process. Now we need to be a little bit wary about how hard we push these patients. And there's a number of other factors that feed into this, but even around that three month mark, particularly looking at a lot of the MRIs that we've had at that time frame, these are patients that often have near full or full graft infill, but we also know it's a primitive tissue. So despite the patient feeling good, despite the MRI showing a really good early outcome, we still need to just put the brakes on a bit. Uh, knee biomechanics. And this is where we start to think about things like graft location and graft size, uh, irrespective of whether it's a tibiofemoral or a patellofemoral lesion. We need to think about weight bearing and we need to think about uh, knee articulation and how that creates not only compressive loading, but also shear loading across that graft surface. Obviously, we need to think about any concomitant procedures and how that may affect uh, what we do rehab wise, that might be an ACL recon, it might be a meniscal repair or an offloading osteotomy. And we need to think about the patient. So not all patients are created equal. Uh, some have had more prior procedures, some are more deconditioned, uh, some are younger, some are older. Um, some wanna get back to some really high level activities and some just wanna get back to a pain-free knee. So we need to think about all this and how we progress that patient. Education for me is probably one of the most important things. It's a big procedure and it does rely on patients behaving. So I'll come back to this briefly, but patients need to be uh, fully informed about the surgery, the rehab process, um, you know, setting realistic goals and expectations. Of course, we wanna be able to restore we know that the early restoration of movement is not only encouraging from a cell stimulus perspective, but we also need to think about the rest of the knee and its response uh, to early movement and load bearing. Progressive weight bearing, and this is where we have had quite a research drive. Uh, we know that that early mechanical environment is critical if we non-weight bear, we provide zero mechanical stimulus, and this doesn't really give the cells the signals they need. If we're too aggressive, if we overload too early, we may well risk an early graft delamination. So we, we need to find that nice, healthy gray zone. Uh, with respect to weight bearing, as I'd mentioned a bit earlier again, uh, this is a, uh, a rehab-based uh, research I've just lost my slide, there we go. Uh, this is a, a real research drive for us. And we've got to the point, uh, particularly in those tibiofemoral lesions where we've successfully progressed patients toward full weight bearing as early as five and generally around six weeks uh, with no adverse effects. Traditionally, um, a, a weight bearing pathway, a full weight bearing time frame of about three months was advocated which of course was a real deterrent um, to the procedure and certainly to patients. And then of course we need to restore strength and function. And it's all well and good to have a good intact graft and a relatively pain-free knee in trivial daily activities, uh, but that's generally not what these patients want. And that's not why the majority of patients embarked on this surgery in the first place. So just looking at things maybe uh, step by step based on timeframes. Uh, Pre-surgery, we love to get our hands on patients. And this is where we're really thinking about uh, a mental, but also that physical pre preparation for surgery uh, without flaring them up. It's also a great time to identify potential non-compliers and turn those patients into compliers. They need to appreciate what they're about to embark on and what 
non-complying means for potentially jeopardizing that surgery. And again, education, and I've mentioned this already, the surgical process, the rehab process, patients need to be informed on what they're about to embark on. Uh, this may also uh, be a little bit fine looking at things like the education of crutches, weight bearing restrictions, activity restrictions, and again, setting some realistic expectations. That could be anything from uh, getting out of a, a knee brace or weaning off crutches. It might be driving a car. It might be returning to their work based on what they do, but also returning to various recreational and sporting activities. This is the information that patients need. As we transition post-surgery, the first couple of weeks, of course, there's a little bit more of a focus on uh, controlling that inflammatory process. From an activity perspective, uh, this is where your circulation and your isometrics and your early passive and even active assisted knee movement activities are going to be a focus. Uh, continuous passive motion machines, certainly thinking about movement. Uh, there's been a lot of talk and there's a lot of published work around these, particularly after a, a all chondral repair procedures. Uh, these are machines that we do use, uh, but certainly it should not be a focus. And again, early post-op, uh, can they safely ambulate on sticks? Uh, do they appreciate what weight bearing levels they should be working at? Uh, this needs to be reiterated because we don't want them to jeopardise what's been done. As we move a little bit further around that, uh, about that rehab continuum, uh, certainly between two and four weeks, this is when most patients are starting to move toward an outpatient rehab setting, uh, both in a clinic, uh, but also maybe in a pool-based setting. And certainly hydrotherapy and pool activities can provide a really nice unweighted segue for a lot of these patients prior to, to transitioning uh, toward activities that have more of a load demand. As we get up towards six weeks, and I'm, I'm using some fairly specific timeframes, we, we need to appreciate a lot of this is also very criterion based. But as we move up towards six weeks, we're looking to progress some of their strength-based activities, often weaning them off those crutches. Uh, and this is where we start to incorporate things like uh, cycling. Six to 12 weeks, and certainly as we move up toward that 10 week to three month timeframe, we want to be able to advocate a weight bearing and functional based focus wherever possible. Beyond three months, and this is sometimes where we have the luxury of not only taking how they're performing clinically, but also uh, that there may well be uh, an early MRI based scan. And we have seen that um, incorporated by some surgeons. Uh, nonetheless, this is where we wanna start loading them up. So there needs to be a progression toward those functional closed kinetic chain activities with somewhat of a single leg modified focus, we need to start tapping into that chain. Beyond six months, this is where things really are quite open-ended and every patient progresses a little bit differently. Uh, nonetheless, in your ideal patient, they should be getting to the point where they've restored good lower limb and trunk strength. Their activities become a little bit more complex a little bit more multi-directional, and we're certainly starting to look at the introduction of various jog and running and agility-based programs with a move toward things that are specific to that patient. And this is where we need to start thinking about sport-specific conditioning. What about sport? Look, again, this is very open-ended. Uh, traditionally, following ACI, a return to sport was not advocated until at least 12 months. And that was really taking into account that graft and tissue maturation process. We certainly have patients that return to some of these quite demanding sports well before 12 months. But again, we need to think about tissue maturation. We need to think about conditioning 
and certainly building up that training pathway. And that's the most critical late stage part of transitioning patients back towards sports. A return to sport around 12 months um, sounds quite conservative, but even when you look at your classic ACL reconstruction patient, most of those patients are nowhere near ready for a return to high level pivoting sports until nine months and many well beyond 12 months anyway. Uh, just to wrap up, again, a lot of these rehab plans have been well published, uh, whether it be in the form of a review or a commentary. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these can be provided as needed, uh, but they really have been developed on the back of a long period of patient research and also clinical experience. So again, if, if these are things that everybody, anybody wants to get their hands on, uh, please do feel free to make contact. Uh, there's a couple of emails uh, for me there. They're the easiest ones to get me on if there are any questions that develop following the webinar or if there's any resources that people might want. Um, otherwise, look, uh, much like the others, uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'll, um, I'll stop that screen share and I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Paul. Thanks, Jay. Thanks very much for that um, uh, amazing uh, body of work. Um, incredibly detailed analysis um, at multiple levels in multiple cohorts um, that have gone through that ACI journey um, with you and your, your collaborators. So um, in the uh, five minutes or so that we have remaining, uh, we have had some questions um, from the floor. So if I may uh, ask the panel a couple of those questions um, um, and Martin, the first one is to you. Uh, a question from the floor has been in and around osteochondral lesions um, or OCD lesions uh, within the, the, the Taylor Dome. Um, do you uh, change your approach uh, with the deep lesion? Do you bone graft or, or how does that differ in your, your normal approach in using ACI if there's a, a cystic change or, or, or bone deficit? That's a good question, Paul. Um... If you look at the series of patients that I had up until the consensus meeting, I had not bone grafted the bony defect. Um, obviously, that was right. Um, what came out of the consensus meeting was a recommendation that if the bone um, defect component was deeper than three millimetres, then the consensus was that we should bone graft. So since the consensus, so the, the, the point of the the consensus meeting in Pittsburgh is that it has changed my practice in the sense of now I am bone grafting large bony defects. Having said that, there, if you look at the patients that we've reviewed and followed up, and I think the same experience was had um, in New York uh, that there wasn't actually any problem with not bone grafting the defect, but Certainly now I have changed that. Uh, if the defect's deeper than three millimetres, the problem you get into, and the Italians were very good at the meeting pointing this out, once with the, when you actually lay the Macy down, once you put your fibre and tissue glue and lay the actual membrane down, if, if you've got a defect less than three millimetres, then it's going to sit proud. So, so, and I take the bone, if you want to know where the graft comes from, it's from the eyelet crest. And do you do that in a two-stage procedure or you will graft and then put the Macy on top or the ACI on Correct. top? That, so you, you all do... one stage, all one stage. All one stage, yeah. So you've got to be careful. For those of you, just from a technical point of view, you don't want to raise the graft. It's got to obviously be level with the rest of the articular cartilage. Um, the the fibre and tissue glue does take up some room. The membrane takes up some room. That's why they recommended that it uh, for grafting yeah. for bony defects deeper than three millimetres. Yeah. And a follow-up question in relation to that. So you, you've got a, a bone bed, which is, you know, deeper than, than anatomically normal. Um, how does that manifest itself in an MRI picture? Do you see a restoration of the subchondral, subchondral depth or is it still a, a defect full of cartilage? Um, well, Usually, one of the things I didn't mention, all my patients, I routinely would get an MRI at 12 months because I've only just started. Um, 
the important thing, a few things about MRIs in all our patients, the MRIs are never normal. There's always a little area of edema just underneath the graft, even in the good patients. And that fits with the scoring systems because essentially with this type, when you're dealing with a salvage uh, type procedure, you're not going to return people to normal. It, it's just not possible. So you, you're improving their functional scores and, um, and the MRIs are not normal. But in terms of what's happening to the graphs, um, mm. then I'd have to get back to you because I've only just started since the consensus yeah. meeting. Yeah. Um, yes. But we would, look, no, we would certainly look at that. I think my impression though with the OATS type procedures is that the patient's pain, um, their pain used to dissipate a lot quicker than say with Macy. And I think it was partly to do with the plug, the bone integration, because most of their pain yeah. is from the bone. Um, and that was just a, you know, an observation that I'd made early on. Um, mm. in, in the ankle, I found that the Macy, the patients improved for up to 18 months. Clinically. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, thanks very much um, for, for those insights. And I think, you know, similarly in, um, in the knee, obviously osteochondritis Jessicans is treated with ACI. Uh, there are also slightly deeper lesions than in the ankle, obviously. Um, thanks, Martin. That's fantastic insight. Um, a question for Professor Zhang. Um, <clears throat> question from the floor. We've seen um, an increasing focus or attempt to use um, uh, more uh, point of care type cellular therapies. Um, and we've seen bone marrow aspirate um, uh, is, is, is probably, you know, is, is shown to be um, a desire to see whether that works. What's your comment on the applicability of using a bone marrow uh, mesenchymal stem cell versus a chondrocyte cell? Uh, it's a very good question. I mean, um, we, in, in related to cell therapy, we're, all, we're not promoting one size fit all approach. We are instead, from the regulatory and the scientific point of view, we're looking for what we consider as a homologous use with the clinical evidence. Point of care with MSC and all this is uh, considered as a clinical practice. If you want to use, you can use, but in terms of as a technology with a robust evidence, I think it still need to, be, to develop. And autogos conscious size implantation itself, when you actually analyze the population of cells, it, it contain a conscious size lineage at different stages. Some of the cells actually have a, have a MSC characteristic. And in general speaking, it's like where the tissue take a form with grow those cells and pack this tissue back. It's the best combination of those mixed cell population at different lineages necessary for tissue regeneration. So by, by that then, am I assuming that um, what we're trying to, um, uh, to do here is to have a predictable outcome, um, to um, understand which patients are going to do well and which patients aren't. Um, so from a, a mesenchymal stem cell perspective, then there's a less predictability of outcome. Is that a fair conclusion? You, you can say that, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Prof Seng, for that. Um, uh, question from the floor also uh, for Jay. Um, also in relationship to osteochondritis desiccans, um, does your rehab uh, change if a patient has a lesion which is deeper than the articulating surface that hasn't been bone graft. Do you take into account the fact that it's lying more protected? Does that allow for a, a faster rehab or do you still go down the, the accelerated rehab program? Yeah, look, we, we, we don't deviate. We don't deviate. I mean, certainly given the depth of that lesion, the increased depth of the lesion, uh, in theory, it is even more protected, again, depending on, on maybe size, overall size, but it is more protected. But, you know, I think we've, we've got the, the protocols in general to the point where uh, I'm probably a little bit hesitant to push too much more than that. Um, the other thing with, with the OCD lesion is that, you know, it, the graft itself may be well protected, by, but being a little bit aggressive and effectively creating the sheer, sheer 
on those uh, hopefully nice vertical stable native cartilage walls. I don't know if that potentially poses a risk as well in terms of maybe um, you know deterioration in the adjacent cartilage. So you know, irrespective of whether it's a deeper OCD lesion or something that doesn't penetrate that subchondral bone plate, our protocols generally are quite similar. Excellent. Thanks for that, uh, that, that, that insight into the rehab. Um, that's all the time uh, permits for us today. Um, I'd like to thank um, our um, a fantastic panel who have given um, some fantastic insights into the science uh, the, the, the clinical aspects and, and of course the rehab aspects. Um, all bringing a deep knowledge and all bringing deep clinical data to support the use of ACI for the treatment of articular cartilage defects of the knee and the ankle. And I think that we've seen great history, some strong data, lots of clinical learnings and they have all contributed to the, to the four rights if you like and that is if you choose um, the, the right patient, the right implant uh, with cells and surgeon, the right rehab, you invariably get the right outcome. Um, and so, uh, again, just like to remind the audience that uh, ACI, uh, ortho ACI is available in Australia. It is now on the ARTG. Um, and uh, we look forward to um, um, talking to you about that if, if that's the case. Uh, finally, thanks again to all presenters. Fantastic um, uh, contributions, and thanks to us from uh, thanks from Cell for your kind attendance today. Thank you, and good evening. Thanks. Sir.